Hey everyone, this is Keith Rawson for Crime Factory Magazine. I'm sitting down with uh, Dwayne Swarzynski, who is, and I've been practicing that, um, who's here in, at the Poison Pin in, in Scottsdale, Arizona, um, promoting his newest book, Fun and Games. Dwayne, thanks for sitting down with me today, sir. Thanks, Keith, and good to be here in, in uh, Scottsdale. Absolutely. All right, let's talk about Fun and Games first. Okay. Sure. Now let's pretend nobody's ever heard of this book before. What is it about? Um, basically, it's about an alcoholic house sitter named Charlie Hardy, who is a hired to watch this place in the Hollywood Hills, and he finds a very disturbed and kind of out of her mind girl who he thinks is a teenager on drugs in <laughs> hiding in a room downstairs. And it turns out she's actually an actress, and she claims that people are trying to kill her. And she's telling the truth. They're called the accident people, um, kind of the same type of people who Randy Quaid was talking about not too long ago, the, the Star Whackers. Um, and then Charlie sort of has to go head to head with these people, and chaos ensues, as they say. I want to talk a little bit about the accident people first. Sure. Um, now, I kind of, I noticed kind of a, a similarity between J.G. Ballard's Crash and, and this particular book. Um, it was that something that was intentional in the novel, or was that it, when, when you were actually developing that that those characters? I've never read Crash actually, so really? that's an accident, <laughs> <laughs> so to speak. It's a it's a happy accident when it comes right down yeah. to it. Um, now, this is basically your your first series of novels. Now, your novels right. have always kind of taken place in a shared universe. Now, first question is, right. with the shared universe, is that something that's always been intentional or? You know, basically, where you bridge from one novel to the next, like let's say from Wheelman to the Blonde, right. to you know, sev to uh, Severance Package, was that intentional with with as far as creating that shared universe? It's all been kind of a goof, honestly. You know, I wrote the Wheelman as its own standalone, mm -hmm. and I thought it'd be fun to have a character pop up who may appear in another book. It really, it was just more the idea that you know these things do exist in the same kind of weird murky Philadelphia. And that there would be fun for the readers to spot. If you've read all, all the books, oh, wow, this guy appears over here as well. And I like when books do that. I do like, you know, in Stephen King novels when characters cr pop up, you know, um, a few books later, unrelated stories. Um, it became a problem, actually. My film agent kind of got um, angry because <laughs> when you sell rights to a, a book, you know, you kind of, the, or option a book, the rights, all the character rights are kind of, you know, bundled up with that. And you can't really have characters, you know, repeat unless you're selling a series. So... I'm kind of scared straight away from the uh, shared universe thing a little bit. Um, with fun and games, it's kind of, I, I don't think it, it's not set in the same Philly, but there are no obvious nods, I don't think, okay. that I can think of. Maybe I, subconsciously I have a few things. Was, the, was it your decision to continue on with the series, or did you con consider fun and games, I want to do this as a standalone, or was that, did you always intend it as a right. series? Originally, it was meant to be a standalone, but once I talked to my editor, John Schoenfeld, at Mulholland, mm -hmm. and he kind of started, you know, expanding it with me, kind of saying where, where it could go. If you were to do a three-book series, here's where, you know, things might go. I got really into it and was really excited about it. I mean, we're going home that night from New York, taking the train home to Philly, and plotting the whole way home, like, wow, this could be cool. Um, mm -hmm. And by the time I got home, I had, like, books sort of two and three, at least kind of starting to gel in my mind a little bit. Mm -hmm. So it, was, it wasn't like, you know, um, forced at, like, you know, knife point, you know, you're going to do this series. Um, but it, was, uh, it wasn't intentional. It's kind of a happy accident, like most things in my life. How, how have you liked working with Schoenfelter? Uh, he's a pain in the ass. Yeah. He's evil, just untalented. <laughs> uh, no, I'm kidding. John, I'm kidding. Uh, he's great. He's super well-read. Uh, he and I talk the same language, you know, about, about books. And um, most fun I have is actually being with him uh, over over a meal and just geeking out over novels we've both, you know, read, trying to stump each other, actually. <laughs> I'm always trying to out, outdo John. Absolutely. He's yeah. younger. He's a young whippersnapper, but I try. Yeah, because he's rumored to read, like, three three manuscripts a day. I mean, he just has this incredible rep. He's fierce, and he actually responds to manuscripts ultra quickly. I don't know how he finds time, mm -hmm. but he's back to you with, like, here are my thoughts pretty fast. Absolutely. So, it's great. No. Um, well, let's go ahead and... Now, this is going to be kind of a familiar question. Oh, scissors, actually. These are Sorry. <laughs> no, no, uh, no pressure, Keith, about, you know. Uh, you, you know, I had to, I have to look down at my notes occasionally. Um... <laughs> With, this is a question that's pretty familiar with most writers, okay. um, where basically you ask a writer where they get their ideas. Right. And with you, and it's usually not a question I ask most writers, but with you, it, it's something I wanted to ask for ages. Okay. Where? Where, <laughs> I mean, from Secret Dead Men all the way up to Fun and Games, where does this stuff come from? 
I mean, is it... Yeah. Especially with, like, Secret Deadman. I mean... Right. Come on, you know. That one was an odd case, because that book actually was um, written from... You have to get that? I'm just kidding. Uh, written from... Uh, and I wrote a screenplay, of all things, a murder mystery... Uh, for a contest, and it not only lost, it was unacknowledged, I think. <laughs> this is way back when. And then later, when I write, when, when to write a, a full book, a novel, I figured, okay, I'll just take the screenplay that didn't work, use it as the bones of the plot, and just kind of, like, flesh it out. And in the course of all that, I realized, you know, what was wrong with the murder mystery I plotted, because it just wasn't, you know, wasn't that compelling. And I'm not quite sure where it came from, but I kind of wanted a character, Private Eye, who kind of uh, had a different viewpoint, you know, mm -hmm. and could actually talk to dead people. And then the more I thought about it, the more it got it grew like a fungus in my mind, like this whole idea of like absorbing souls and putting them in a brain hotel and having an entire interior landscape that, you know, I was writing my first book. I didn't know it was wrong and probably shouldn't do that kind of thing, but it was just, I did it as a lark thinking that, um, um, you know, that's, that's how you, you know, write a book. <laughs> so it was like basically, it's, it's a strange, it's an adaptation of a failed screenplay, but it's almost nothing left of the original screenplay in there. It just totally went off in its own direction. Um, and I didn't know any better, so that's where it came from. Are most of your novels like that? Do you, do you basically just let it off the rails and just like go where where you where you basically want the novel to go to? I do. I, I, I try really hard. I, mean, I remember Clive Barker had this great you know line about forbid the pen nothing. And I think that's important when you're you know having an idea you're conceiving and trying to you know nurture. Just let it go and kind of see where it goes, and don't try to think of it in terms of will this be uh, you know commercially viable or will this you know make sense in terms of what's come before. That doesn't matter ultimately. You can always rein it in if you have to, but I think it's the most fun is letting your imagination run with it and the story is boss. Just follow it. And I guess all the books so far have, you know, better or worse, done that. Just follow this, like, um, its own path. And they lead some weird places, which may speak to more about my, my childhood and upbringing than, you know, anything else, but <laughs> that's what happens. Let's talk comics a little bit. All right. Sure. Now, of course, you started off with writing comics with Marvel. Yes. Um, you know, Cable, fantastic run on that. Iron Fist. Thank you. Uh, you covered extensively with my partner, Cameron Ashley. Right. Um, you've now moved over to DC. Now, yes. is this, first off, is this a permanent move? Oh, no, it's not exclusive or anything. I'm just, you know, gun for hire. Uh, my, I have a Marvel contract, which was up uh, earlier this year, mm -hmm. and just, you know, itching to try different things. So, mm -hmm. the DC called me and kind of pitched the idea of, or just asked about if I was interested in Birds of Prey, which... Huge Batman fan, huge fan of Gotham City. So the idea of setting a you know a team, all female you know covert ops group book in Gotham City was like yes, I couldn't say yes fast enough. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. So how have you liked? You, you're working primarily with Batwoman, correct? Uh, no, the team's a little different actually. It's really? um, uh, one character that holds over from the uh, previous team is Black Canary, you know, classic, you know, mm -hmm. great badass. Um, and there are some other characters who have cropped up. Um, who have been revealed as a new character, which is really exciting, that we created. Myself and the artist, uh, Jesus Saiz, we created this new character named Starling. She's sort of a, a spy savant, you know, with a full sleeve tattoo and, you know, wears a corset. She's just great. I love her. Um, in fact, I, I just took to her for some reason. You know, this, this, uh, it's, it's possible to fall in love with your own, like, you know, partial creation. Uh, I think both of us are really digging here. And uh, some other, you know, I can't mention all the team members yet because it kind of evolves over the issues, the first three issues, the team builds, but it's kind of surprising. There's one very surprising villain, S, who pops up as a teammate. How do you feel about the the, the new 52 reboot that DC is doing with this, uh, with this coming year? Right. I think it's very smart in terms of um, bringing more eyes to the books. You know, I think... Even as a lifelong comics fan, there are times that I can get really lost in the shuffle of, you know, all the books you have to read to follow a story. You know, and that's not to knock the events, but it is, it can be, you know, if it's off-putting to me sometimes, imagine how it is for someone, you know, who wants to take their first step into a comic shop and try something because they've seen a movie or heard friends talking about a certain character. So I think the uh, being inclusive is great, that you know, invite new eyes, you know, and I hope that the, uh, you know, long-time readers, I'm one of them, We'll go, you know, have fun with it as well. Um, I'm, I'm actually not sure why it's all that shocking because people do it all the time in comics. Well, you know, yeah, DC's been doing it for the past twenty years. Oh basically. yeah, everyone. So it's you know, I don't think it's. I think it's a smart move, you know. Obviously, and it's mm -hmm. fun to be part of a, a, a book launching from ground zero. But you know, it's just interesting stuff. Absolutely. Now you mentioned at your appearance with the next book. Yes. Okay. After the third book is completed. <laughs> 
We talk uh, a thousand page epic. Eagle ear Keith Ross on yeah. the case. Yeah. Um, it's still forming my mind. I mean, not a thousand pages, but I kind of want to write something a little more expansive. And uh, I have an idea. I never talk about things in advance. It's like, so new. It's like a. Mm-hmm. It's it's a. The sperm hasn't met egg yet in my head, really. In, in logic, but I have an idea, and it might be something different for me. Um, that's all I can say about that. <laughs> I gotta ask, even you know, with. Um because both you and I share a lot of early influences, especially right. with horror writers. Right. Um, how much has the horror genre really um, influenced you as a writer? Oh, hugely. I mean, I, um, you know, the first adult novel I read, I think it was 13, maybe even 12, was Stephen King's It. I mean, if you have a, a first novel to read, it's this giant slab of a book, and I devoured that thing. I think it took me three weeks to read it, and that's the time we had at the library to have it checked out. Mm-hmm. Um, but from there, I kind of, you know, would read anything I could. From King, I went to Clive Barker, who just blew my mind. The Books of Blood. I remember the lights went on in my head all of a sudden. Like, wow, you can do so much with, you know, the horror genre. Um, it's a brilliant collection of every possible subgenre he covers in this collection. I thought, how brilliant is that? Mm-hmm. Uh, from there, the splatterpunk guys like David Scow, John Skip and Craig Spector, um, Joe Lansdale, you know, Yep. Huge influence for both of us, Keith. And, you know, from there, I really just, I think it would appeal to me, and maybe it's the case for you as well, just like anything goes, almost like pure imagination. Mm-hmm. It's not so much the, the, the blood and the violence, although that was, you know, a, a factor, but I just thought it was the most creative stuff being done. I just was having my mind blown, you know, mm-hmm. every book I read that, you know, fired in all cylinders for me. Absolutely. So, Dwayne, it was a pleasure having you here tonight. Awesome. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, everyone. Um, once again, everyone, this is Dwayne Straczynski. Sorry for butchering your name, Dwayne. And perfect. Uh, this is um, it's Keith fine, for, Keith. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I'm in trouble. Uh, <laughs> but this is Keith from Crime Factory Magazine, and we'll see you guys next time.